Good morning, church family. We are going to kick off our morning service. So folks in the foyer, if you don't mind making your way in, we always uh, start off our mornings with a few announcements. And, um, oh, see. Uh, so today is the first Sunday of March, and every first Sunday we have our food and fellowship meal after second service please join us today 12 noon for a meal uh invite your friends family this is an opportunity for us uh to get together and break bread um please join us if you're available we have a lot for whatever reason first sundays we always have a lot going on and this sunday is no different um we have our child dedication coming up later this month there is an informational session in the nursery around 1230. Discipleship committee is meeting again. This is part two, meeting in the Antioch room. Lunch is included. Grab lunch, head on down. Young married couples is meeting in the Ephesus sunlight room. Step by step is in the fellowship hall as well. So lots of activity this afternoon. Uh, please, uh, if you need any guidance or direction, go see Pastor Chris. He knows where everything is happening. Um, also, last but not least, Handbell will be practicing here, 1230 in the sanctuary. So again, lots of lots of things going on. As spring comes around and as summer comes around, our activities definitely do um, ramp up. One of the things that I wanted to call attention to is uh, we, we kind of want to minimize our announcement time on Sundays. And one of the things that uh, we do very diligently is we post everything all the events, all the happenings on our church website. And so if you don't know what the latest is going on, please go to our website. We list it all there. Uh, it's, it, it is the authoritative place to get all the information. A um, couple of other updates. So uh, Easter retreat uh, later uh, next month. Signups begin today in the foyer. And then next weekend, we have a number of activities. Um, CFF has a potluck from 5 to 8.30. Uh, they're going to continue their series. If you have any questions, reach out to Ruby. We also have a um, fundraising event with Alpha Pregnancy Centers. Please see Pastor Kevin if you have any questions or uh, you're looking to attend or, or support that ministry. And then the following Sunday next week, uh, we're continuing. This is part three of the pickleball series with, with our sports ministry. And then we also have a baptismal service the third week of March. Please reach out to Pastor Kevin uh, if you or someone in your family is interested in being baptized. And then, uh, again, as the summer rolls around, our activities ramp up. We are accepting applications right now for day camp staffers. Uh, and so if you know uh, that you're going to be interested in serving participating. It's uh, one of our obviously biggest annual events, um, and it's a large part of our youth program. Uh, please sign up. There's a QR code there. We also have it out in the foyer. And then lastly, we want to remind the church family of our missionary of the week, the Duns, and they are serving as aviation maintenance uh, in Papua New Guinea with Ethnos uh, 360. They're actually back in the States. They uh, have adopted a little boy named TJ. And TJ uh, has some health problems, and they've been uh, able to get diagnosis uh, treatment. Um, but please be in prayer for the Duns. Uh, pray for their support. Uh, also, just ongoing treatment for TJ. He has uh, some lung disease that was uh, chronic from, from uh, premature birth. Um, and just lift them up in prayer this week. Uh, we continue to want to support our missionaries. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to the worship team. Good morning. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Our psalm said this morning, focuses on God as creator. And when we see the works of his hands, if you had difficulty sleeping last night as the rains came down, it was a, may that really be a reminder, though, that Everything that we see outside, all this is the handiwork of a God that is all-powerful. And this God that is in control of not only nature and not only our lives, but he 
really holds all of the world in his hands. And the only proper response in being in the presence of such greatness and of such power is really to be shocked and awed. And when we come into the presence of this great king and creator, you might have different responses. Maybe we'll just be stunned in silence. Maybe you can't but help but bow down and to worship and to pray before this powerful God. Whatever your response, may it be one of worship. And the psalmist in chapter 33, verses 6 through 8, it really shows this relationship between God creator and us in a, in a marvelous way. So if you're able, would you please stand as I read God's word? Psalm 33, 6 says this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens are made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. This God that we come and worship this morning spoke all of creation into existence with just a word. And he said that it was good. And so in light of such a holy and mighty God, may we lift up all the praises and all the worship and glory due his name. Let's open this time in prayer and worship together. Heavenly Father, we come before you, humbled and amazed that you would still choose to love us. That even though you have all of creation in your hands, yet you still intimately know the details of our lives, the secrets of our hearts. You know the number of hairs on our head, and you know all the steps in front of us. And so may we yield our life to you, looking to you for a hope and for a future, knowing that you have our best in store. And so may we worship you, looking to Christ, rejoicing that we are saved, that we are forgiven, and so we might come before you to worship you with all that we are. And we cast aside all the baggage, all the hurts, all the things that prevented us from thinking about you this week. May those things be let go so that we might embrace the God of all the universe. Thank you for loving us. May we respond with worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are beautiful beyond description. To marvel this your words. Wonderful comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard. Can grasp your infinite with his love. Can fathom the depth of your love. Beyond description. That you see me in the world. I stare. I stand in all I stand, I stand in all of Only God to who praise can I stand in all I do. You are beautiful beyond this rich sun. There's God's rights to pour my sin. Grass, such tender compassion, and that this mercy so free. 
I stand in all my fear. And I stand, I stand in all of you. Stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God to the Lord, all in his name I stand even on the I stand even on the I stand even on the Splendor of the King. The splendor of the King. Holy majesty, let all the earth rejoice. While the earth rejoices, he wraps himself in darkness, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great is God. And this rebate will stand. And time is telling us hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God and three and one, Father, the Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. Lion and the Lamb, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all but 
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by me. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to the knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. You has told every lightning bolt where it should go. For seen heavenly storehouses laid in with snow. Who imagined the sun and your source to its light? It conceals it to bring us the coolness of that. None can fathom indescribable. Uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to thy knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Incomparable. Unchangeable, you see the depths of our hearts and you love us the same. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. We have a couple of messages left in this section where Jesus is inaugurating his early ministry, challenging us to be fully committed to the ministry because there are no casual Christians. Jesus is the game changer. He is changing the game of how the Jewish religion looks at itself. And it is not without controversy. There are going to be new rules in baseball this brand new season. Pitchers will have 15 seconds upon receiving the ball to start their motion. 20 seconds with runners on base 
If they don't begin it, the batter will be assessed an extra ball. Batters have to be ready when the pitch clock hits eight seconds or they will be designated a strike. They are banning the infield shift. They are starting extra innings with a runner at second base. And there's already criticism in spring training that they don't like the changes or that they do like the changes. There's all kinds of opinions in the new rules. Rules are, are important. But when rules become more important than the people that they serve, it becomes dangerous, particularly in ministry. Ministry is about mercy, not judgmentalism. And this is what Jesus is encountering as he is beginning his ministry. He was baptized. He then announces that he is here in the spirit of Isaiah 61 to heal the sick, to give sight to the blind, to to give freedom to the oppressed. His ministry is that of mercy. And then he goes on and he starts healing people, even on a Saturday. And some people had big rules that that was a no-no to do healing on a Saturday. But let's go back and talk about rules. Rules are not necessarily bad. God gave Moses 10 of them, actually 613 of them in the Old Testament. Biblical rules define what God's righteousness is for us. And so if we didn't know the rules, we wouldn't know what morality is. And that's the problem today, is that the obliteration of the Bible as a moral code, as God's moral authority, now we live in a lawless day like the book of Judges, where everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. But rules are good, defines what is right. Extra biblical rules can keep things orderly. They're not necessarily bad either, right? A teacher has rules that aren't necessarily found in the Bible. Don't don't chew gum in class. Don't eat candy in class. Don't be on your cell phone during class, right? If you're going to go to the bathroom, you need a hall pass, right? All of that is to maintain order. So when the intent is orderliness, extra biblical rules are, are good. Right, we give them to our kids, you know, and we 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 tell them, uh, you know, you can't go out of the house. Here's a curfew. Those aren't necessarily in the Bible, but we will have certain rules for their protection, and it's it's for the point of orderliness. But if we start using them for superiority, then it becomes a problem. Like if we rig the game so it'll be advantageous to us. Right. Like if uh, we expanded the NBA to four point shots and we have Steph Curry. Right. I mean, that's going to be an advantage for us and not the teams with just big guys that will just shoot on the inside. And so it's it's when you you fix the system. To cater to yourself, that's what the Pharisees did. They had hundreds of years of adding to the scripture, writing commentaries and saying, well, this is how we're going to apply uh, this commandment. And so all then their applications then become rules. And then they would judge each other uh, by saying, well, like Jesus' story of, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee looked at the, the hated tax collector and says, I thank God I'm not like that tax collector. You know, I am excellent in my tithing. I'm excellent in my, you know, in, in my outward life. So what we're doing is we have one more message in this section, and then we're going to start a series on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus aims in the Beatitudes at the externalism of the Pharisees and focuses on the inside, right? And so so really, Christ changes us from the inside, but if you're just trying to look good on the outside because you're trying to save face, right? You're trying to look good at church on the outside, but, but you're not revealing the inside of your heart, then you've, you're in a rigged system where extra biblical rules are used for superiority. So when we understand that religious extra biblical rules are employed to make you seem more righteous than somebody else, then it becomes an issue of spiritual pride. 
It becomes an issue of spiritual pride. And so these type of laws, some of them just need to be done away with. If they are controlling laws used to control others, such as Jim Crow laws, Jim Crow laws limited what African Americans could do, what blacks could do in America because they weren't white. It's so when I talked to the pastor at Third Baptist Church, Redwood City, and I said, oh, were you the third church in town? And he says, no. Back in the days when our church started, the Jim Crow laws prohibited any church that wasn't white to be a First Baptist church. <gasps> you're kidding. I mean, I didn't say you're kidding. I thought you're kidding. But I mean, it was, it was, I knew he wasn't kidding. It was horrible. But yet, it was these types of laws that are, are, are used or, or laws that permitted slavery that William Wilberforce had to scripturally prove was not biblical to hold another person a slave. And that Abraham Lincoln had to enforce in the United States or laws that denied women voting. Right? And so it's, it's these types of laws that were used to keep certain people uh, superior than other people. That's when the rules become that of spiritual pride or, or whatever kind of pride become dangerous. Now, who are the judgmental ones? Who are the judgmental ones? First, the proud. The proud compare themselves in this rigged system where the Pharisees say, well, we know the Old Testament better, so we're going to tell you how to apply it. Cults can do this because they're not letting people read the scriptures themselves, so only their powerful authority can tell what goes on and the rules that you have to face. That's also part of the controlling, the controlling aspect. And why do people have controlling laws? Because they're insecure. I mean, think of the bully at school. The bully at school isn't the cool kid at school, right? The cool kid is okay with everybody being who they are, right? But, but if you're insecure, then you got to pick on somebody else to make yourself feel important. That's the, the basis of the queen bee or the, or the boy bully in school is that they have to control because you're insecure. Bully cops think that they're above the law. Bully pastors are lazy and find that it's easier to throw around their authority and, and, and say, well, you have to do it because I'm a pastor. I started on this book by Michael Kruger called Bully Pulpit, published in 2022, where he says abuse involves domineering, bullying behavior, leaving the abused in genuine fear, especially if the abuse involves threats of church discipline. There's been a couple of recent examples of bully pulpit. Christianity Today published a podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, where it talks about a, a pastor who resigned in 2014 uh, from his church called Mar Mars Hill Church in, in the Seattle area for, quote unquote, abusive and intimidating conduct, which included harsh language, belittling staff, and verbally assaulting everyone who disagreed with him. There was another popular pastor in the Illinois area that had several church planting in his network who resigned in 2018 for domineering and bullying abusive speech, outbursts of anger. C.S. Lewis wrote, of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst. I don't disagree with him. So there are people who will use rules to because they're proud. There are, are, are people who use rules because they want to stay in control. There are others who just love their traditions and want to keep things the way that it was. Did you know that a couple of decades ago, if you wanted to be a member of Fellowship Bible Church, we had requirements about lifestyle things that you couldn't do. They weren't in the Bible. They were just things that you couldn't do. It's that attitude of, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't hang with those who do. And it's, it's just feeling, oh, self-righteous and, oh, you know, you know, I'm a pretty boy. I'm a, you know, I keep myself clean, not like you fools, right? And it's that type of attitude. 
And it's, uh, it's uh, that, that has changed because it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Four or five years ago, two boards that I served with, both IFCA and BMW, and this is in God's Republic, but we made a shift in our, our requirements for membership. Because for the longest time, if people were drinking alcohol, they couldn't join BMW or the IFCA. Or if they were divorced, they couldn't join. And Jesus has inception clause for those who are victimized by the area of divorce. And we say, is everybody guilty? Uh, uh, you know, just because they have the divorce label on them. And so we took those things away because they're, they're not in the Bible. And there was, there were some in the old guard in the old school, the debates were vigorous. And we had to respond to the debates. I was given a topic where I had to respond in front of, uh, you know, hundreds of people who, uh, some were my friends who disagreed with me and saying, guys, this is cultural fundamentalism where we are, we are pushing non-biblical principles to maintain a culture that's not biblical. Let's stick with what the scriptures say. There's enough for us to work on just with what the Bible says than us throwing out extra rules like the Pharisees. I didn't say like the Pharisees because then my friends would have got really mad. But, you know, but it's, 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 it's that particular idea. When I was at uh, the conference I was speaking at in Texas, right? people came to me in the lobby, not everybody, just, just a hand, just one or two. Yeah, you know, and, and really wanted to make the King James version a big deal because I wasn't using King James. You know, when I get all these comments like, oh, you know, well, our church, we're going to have a conference on why like, the King James version is the best Bible out there, you know, and it's, it's the only one you should trust. And I said, well, you enjoy. I don't agree with you. I taught a whole class on this, but I'm not going to take this time to pick a fight because grace goes both ways. Grace goes to the left of you. Grace goes to the right of you. Grace goes to the red of you, and grace goes to the blue of you, if you know what I mean, politically speaking. But, I mean, I knew I was going in deep red when I went to Texas. I knew when they said, you know, hey, we, we don't do worship teams. We do hymns only. We wear a tie and a jacket. And, you know, here's, here's eight translations you can use. <laughs> right? So, so it was a little broader than one. And, 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 you know, there were, there were things I needed to conform to, and I badly did. They're, they're not big deals to argue this way about or to argue that way about, right? I'm just not going to pick those battles. But there's the traditionalist. Then there's the weaker Christian. The weaker Christian throws out all kinds of rules because they don't know what it's like to walk in grace. And so in Romans 14, Paul gives the example of meat offered to idols. And there were people who would not touch meat that were once offered to idols, even though they're cheaper in the store because they came out of idolatry. And they said, oh, oh no, no, we can't touch that. I remember playing mahjong at a church picnic. We were at a, back when our church picnic was in that little Burlingame corner of Aqua Park. And, uh, and, and I remember playing mahjong there and I was playing with some of the grandmas at our church. And then there was like some, somebody else who came by and says, oh, pastor's playing mahjong. You know, that's evil. You know, and then, you know, but, but I understood, you know, there are some people who come out of mahjong and the gambling dens in Chinatown and, you know, and they brought their family to poverty and, you know, they have different experiences. And the others didn't like every New Year's Eve, my mom, dad, my brother and I, we would watch Guy Lombardo bring in the new year playing Mahjong, right? We didn't gamble. It wasn't about money. It was just, it was gin rummy with tiles, right? It was rummicute. It's the same game as rummicute, right? And, and so it's, uh, you know, except with Chinese writing. And so, so it's, uh, but, but you know, I said, I'm not going to argue about it. So I stopped playing until I didn't see the person anymore. But, but some people have to have all these, all these rules because they can't handle the grace because they came out of idolatry. So they can eat the meat offered to idols. But Paul said, I don't believe in idols. I don't have a problem eating meat offered to idols, but if it's going to be a stumbling rock to a weaker brother, 
no, no, we're free. Not, not a big deal. It's not a big deal either way. But weaker believers need more con construct. They need more barriers because, you know, it's, it's kind of like, okay, I don't want my kid to get out the door. So the safety gate isn't enough. We have a gate on the downstairs and then we have a double bolt the lock and the chain on the door so that, that they, the kids can't reach. And then we have the fence on the outside. And so with good intentions, you set up all of these things, but after a while, you got to, you know, when you mature, then you know how to deal and overcome those barriers. When you're immature, you need more barriers. When you're more mature, you don't need these non-biblical barriers. So that's why the proud, the controlling, the traditionalist, and the weak Christian need to throw out more of these laws that are more than the Bible teaches. So, with that being said, that's the Pharisees. The Pharisees were doing this because they were controlling and they were proud, right? They were, uh, and, and they were traditionalists, all right? And they weren't necessarily the weaker Christians because they weren't believers. But those first three would apply to the Pharisees. And so this is the context of who Jesus is dealing with. He's going to change the old way. And he's going to bring new wine that their old wineskins cannot take. He's going to he's gonna say, I'm going to give you a new garment, a robe of righteousness. You can't just put on a new patch on the old garment and expect it to last. It's, it's just, right? So Jesus gives that illustration that he's here to be the game changer. And it's because their old game was legalism. And Jesus' new game is mercy. And those conflicted with each other, and I'm going to show you how. So first, we see that legalism cares more about rules than needs. Cares more about rules than needs. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, kind of think of, you know, uh, Maximus, the gladiator, kind of walking through, feeling the wheat. And so the disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Now, what they were doing was perfectly biblical. Deuteronomy 23, 25 says, if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Right? If you use a sickle, it's kind of like mass production. But right, you're picking up some wheat because you're hungry and you're rubbing it and you're eating the grain. That's just mercy. You're feeding the hungry. And so biblically, it was permitted. But we see in verse 2, the Pharisees are watching carefully, hoping to catch the disciples breaking the law. Now, they said, I mean, they, here's what they did. They took the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. You shall honor the Sabbath, which is Saturday. It's just a, you know, it's a Hebrew word of saying Saturday. Honor Saturday because God worked six days and then he rested on the seventh. The seventh is the Sabbath. And so on the day that God rested, you rest too. It was meant to help us rest. It was not meant to live in fear of just... You know, judgmentalists, right? And so, but what the Pharisees did in their hundreds of years, remember the Pharisees started with Ezra, Nehemiah, right in those times. The word Pharisee means to separate and, and their job was to keep Israel separate from the rest of the world. But they kind of went a little overboard. And they said, you know, this rule stuff works really good for us, you know, because we grow up, we have all this knowledge and everybody else, they don't have as much knowledge as we, the scribes and the Pharisees do. We're going to use this to rig the system to say, well, you know, who are you going to out argue us? Because we're the lawyers and the religious teachers. And so here they are as the Pharisees. They took this one law of honor the Sabbath and they came up with 39 applications. They say 40 less one. 40 less one. 39 ways to uh, 39 prohibitions in the Mishnah of what you cannot do on the Sabbath day. And so when they were picking up food, they said, you're reaping, because as, as, as cited by Bach in his commentary, he says, reaping, threshing, winnowing, and preparing food was a quadruple violation. 
And so when they picked food, eh, when they rubbed it in their hands, they said, that's threshing, right? You're separating the wheat from the shaft. <gasps> you know, but how, how, how else are you going to eat it, right? Are you going to eat the, the outside of the pistachio, right? Are you going to eat the shell? No, you're going to peel the shell and eat the, eat the stuff on the inside. And that's what they're doing with the wheat. And so they plucked and they ate the heads of grain, rubbed it in their hands, and the Pharisees said, oh, you're breaking 39 of our, our laws, you know, or four of the 39 of our laws. Chuck Swindoll worded it beautifully. He said, of course, the disciples were well within the requirements of God's law, but the Pharisees' list of right or wrong stretched much longer than God's. Jesus' Jesus's men violated Code 146B, Section 42, Paragraph 16, Line 4, Subclause 16D of the Sabbath Protection Act of 8012. <laughs> I love that part. And that's this is exactly how tedious they were. They didn't like the new wine going into their old wine skins. And so this is a dangerous precedent. And for us to have... In, in, to, to force people into, for example, a modern day cultural fundamentalism, to fit into these rules that aren't in the Bible and to judge people because of it. That's a lot of the dumb stuff I did in my early years as a pastor. Some of those were just these issues that uh, I, I was young, I needed all those guardrails. I wasn't able to walk in grace. And, and so, you know, I had all, all these guardrails and I'd fight for them. And then I, I separated from people over issues that just don't matter. That's why I'm going to an ordination later today. And the last time I was at an ordination, I challenged the young pastor. I said, fight the good fight. Don't fight bad fights. Because there's a lot of fights that we can get into that won't matter in 10 years. And that aren't issues in scripture. And we, we can divide and fight on a lot of those things that just really do not matter. I sent an article to my uh, my family uh, about this Duggar daughter named Ginger. I don't know if you ever saw that, you know, like 35,000 kids in Japan. Uh, but this, this family had just a lot of kids, and they were involved in this uh, this ministry at, out of Illinois that, that, uh, that would impose extra rules. I know because we even went to one of those, those youth seminars a long time ago, and then when we realized this guy's whack, you know, because he's really doing an eisegesis where he reads into scripture and he pulls out his thoughts and uses scripture to pull out his thoughts rather than drawing out thoughts from the scripture. He puts his thoughts into the scripture. That's called eisegesis instead of exegesis. And so, so we said, Oh, this, this guy's dangerous. So we, we just like dropped all his stuff. I threw all his books away, you know, and, and, but, but this ministry is still going on and this ginger was growing up in it and she, she, uh, she she writes in this book, Becoming Free, that uh, she had to disentangle her beliefs and join uh, the growing wave of Christians who say they've shifted and deepened their faith by leaving legalism. She was constantly worried that God wanted to punish her disobedience for not confessing some secret sin, playing boom ball instead of praying, accidentally revealing her knee in a skirt, exposing herself to alcohol at the grocery store, even not eating enough fiber in her bread. In her 20s, she finally found a gracious God who made himself clear in his word without the need for this man's rules. That, that was a quote out of Christianity Today, March 2023. And, and so here is this, uh, this system of legalism that still exists, where... Rules are more important than a person's needs. In Christ, we're free to do righteousness. We don't need these extra laws to make us prisoners again. Secondly, mercy helps those in need, not antagonizing them. Mercy helps those in need, not antagonizing them. And Jesus answered, guys, haven't you read the Old Testament? Don't you know that in... First Samuel chapter 21, 1 and 7, and chapter 22, 9 and 10. Have you not read in First Samuel that David, when he was hungry, running away from Saul, who was trying to kill him with his men, he runs 
to the tabernacle. Those who were with them, they entered the house of God and they took and ate the bread of the presence. The bread of the presence was 12 loaves that were on a gold table in the, the holy portion of the tabernacle. The, this bread was to represent God's presence and provision as God provided manna. God provides bread, the sustenance for life. Jesus is the bread of life. And so, so bread is highly symbolic. But David asked for five pieces of bread. Uh, and this is bread that's not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And also gave it to those with them. So he says, have you not read? First, David, uh, Jesus is point number one. David's people did nothing wrong, so neither did the disciples. Number two, he's saying, here's a priest by the name of Ahimelech. Ahimelech from Nob. Ahimelech from Nob was approached by David saying, hey, can you give us bread to, to feed my hungry men? Take five loaves of the 12 on the gold table. Right, This bread is replaced every week, every Sabbath. A new 12 loaves goes here. But he gives them the bread, and we don't know if it was on a Sabbath or not, but he gives them five loaves, and and this is consecrated bread that nobody but the priests would be able to, to eat. But these men were hungry, and so he fed them. And so, so point number one, the disciples are doing nothing wrong because David and his people did nothing wrong by eating, eating this special ceremonial bread. And then secondly, he's saying, why can't you be more like Ahimelech? He's a priest. You guys are priests. And yet you priests, you're more concerned about your rules. And Ahimelech was more concerned about these hungry men. Who's acting more like God at this point? Now, what happens is Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, also talks about this text, but gives us a little bit more information about what Jesus said here. It's a little more concise than Luke. So here we, we see... In the first part, he talks about the sacred loaves and the bread. And then he says here in the blue, and haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I mean, hello, they're working on the Sabbath. Hello, I'm working today. You know, and so uh, he goes, I tell you that there is one here who is greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. Right? The disciples are innocent. They're not breaking any law. And then, and then not only are they innocent, not breaking any law, not only are you not like the Himalek, but also the scriptures say, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. You guys think you're so precise in your sacrifices. Oh, look how much you tithe. Look how much you give. Yeah, we have tithe and a tithe and, a, and, and then another tithe on another tithe uh, every thir- three years. And so, you know, here you're looking at how great you are and, and what you sacrifice. And you haven't shown mercy. You haven't shown mercy. He's quoting Hosea 6.6. 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. So here, the need of man, the need of man, mercy, is more important than your sacrifice. We're talking sacrifice. One more, Jesus is point four. The sa- he, he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I created the Sabbath. Who were you to determine what could be done on the Sabbath when I'm the one who created it? Gildan High says, in straightforward language, Jesus taught that the observance of the Sabbath should never degenerate into dead outward formalism, which constitutes a stumbling block for the full development of the life of the believer. Right here, you're making the Sabbath something that people will stumble over by creating your 39 little extra laws. God set the Sabbath apart so it would meet man's needs. And here, they are more focused on antagonizing than meeting 
means. So we go to another scene. It's another Sabbath. We don't know if it's the week after. It's just another Sabbath day. Jesus enters the synagogue and was teaching because that's what Jesus does on the Sabbath. And there was a man there who whose right hand was withered. Oh, what withering heights he fell from. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath. What's he doing? Oh, he's going to do it. There's that guy with a withered hand. I see Jesus coming towards him. Oh, yeah, we got him now. Oh, you got the tape rolling? Yeah, yeah, you got the recording? Okay, we're going to get this guy so good. So the scribes and the Pharisees watched him just like that to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. Legalism is seeking to accuse rather than to show mercy. Now, we don't know if this guy with the withered hand was a plant. We do get some information from an extra biblical book called the Gospel of the Nazareans that described this man as a former stonemason whose injury prevented him from working. How much of that is, uh, you know, how much of that is really true or not, but but it gives us a little sense of the story here. But is religion about accusing or is it about showing mercy? Let me ask it this way. When we come to church, are we more judgy than merciful? Look how he's dressed. Oh, look at their face. They must not have prayed before they came to church today. You know, do we do we walk into church saying, I parked so far today so that I can save space for all these other people in the parking lot? Do we come in more judgy than we are merciful saying, who's hurt? Who's broken? Who has a withering hand? Who needs encouragement today? Oh, you can't do it. It's the Sabbath day. We got 39 laws. It says you can. They're not 39 laws from God. There's only 39 laws that you made to, to fix the game, to make you look better. You know, over the past three and the third decades of ministry here, as a pastor of this church, I've been accused of being too conservative. I've also been accused of being too liberal. Yes, there are people who think we're liberal. There are people who say we're too heavy. Others who say we're too light. Where's Goldilocks when you need it? Gossip spreads. And instead of judging us for being weak, and we have our weaknesses, we're not a perfect church, but we're, we're, we have weaknesses. Instead of it's judging us for being weak, why not come alongside us and say, here's how we're going to help you. You know what? Our, our church, we're strong in this. We can come alongside and help you with this. Isn't that a better attitude than just saying, oh, you know, that church down the street? That's why I meet with the pastors in our community. That's why, I, I don't, don't be surprised, the next couple of months, we're going to have pastors uh, have, have a lunch here hosted by us. Because we're not in competition. We're, we're not out there. It's, it's, it's hard enough trying to be a witness and a light in this peninsula then, and then for us to go around gossiping about this church and that church and, and rooting for their downfall. I'm not rooting for their downfall. And so when we have lunch together and we're sharing prayer requests, yes, we have our differences. We're from different denominations and we have different views on this and different views on that. But we all love the Lord. We all love the gospel. We all want to see this peninsula one to the Lord. And, and we are not enemies. So I am not going to engage in gossip about them. Because they're my brothers. They're my brothers. And yet we can have this idea of, oh, you know, judge, instead of saying, how can I come alongside and help? And we got some people who, who might be able to help you with this. And to have that spirit of brotherhood, then to just accuse. How do we come to church? 
And how do we view other churches? How do we view people who might do ministry differently than us? And oh, yes, maybe a little too conservative, maybe a little too liberal. I hope the Lord would be pleased with me just trying to be biblical. The fourth thing we see here about mercy is mercy helps while legalism destroys. Jesus knew their thoughts. They knew they were there. They were watching, you know, with their, their night vision goggles with super amplification and every spy toy that was in the zero century. And so he, he said to the man with the withered hand, he wasn't afraid. He says, I'm going to heal this guy. So he says to the man with the, with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he arose and he stood there. And Jesus said, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them, all he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. See, Jesus said, I have come. For mercy, he cites. I remember Pastor Chris speaking on on Luke chapter four, and I remember him quoting Isaiah sixty one, where the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim or proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, give the sight to the blind, liberty to those who are oppressed. Then Jesus goes; he heals a demoniac, a leper, a paralytic being dropped down from a rooftop because it was too crowded. Right? His was a mission of mercy. And then he says, I have come not to the well who have no need of a physician, but to those who are sick. I have come to call the righteous, not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. For sinners to get right. For, for the doctor, uh, you, you know, for, for us finally admitting, oh yeah, okay, I need to go see a doctor instead of being, being stubborn about it. Spiritually speaking, some of us are stubborn about needing spiritual help. But Jesus came for those who need help. And yet, we're spending time destroying others instead of helping. Are we doing more legalism than mercy? Lastly, legalism is a threat. It's threatened by Jesus' mercy. Legalism threatened by Jesus' mercy. So here, they were filled, the, the Pharisees were furious, the furious Pharisees, and they discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Mark adds that the Pharisees went out and counseled with the Herodians against Jesus on how to kill him, how to destroy him. So hence the murderous plot of Jesus begins. Who came for mercy, Lord of the Sabbath, who came to heal and to save and to forgive sins. And that was such a new rule that old baseball hates that they wanted to get rid of the commissioner, right? So they want to get rid of Jesus. Legalism is threatened by Jesus' mercy. So just some last thoughts. You know, this is a hospital. This is a place where the sick come to meet the great physician, Jesus Christ to be healed from our sin. To, uh, he didn't come for the righteous, but he came to call sinners to repentance. That's to get right. But God isn't looking for the perfect faith. And if we become arbiters through our extra rules to say, oh, well, this is what perfect faith looks like, then we have faith. This is mercy ministry. Jesus came to have mercy on the sick and the sinful. And so don't think of Jesus as this big rules guy where you have to do all these rules. You come to Christ himself because he says, come all who are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will be gentle. And I will give you rest for your souls. Jesus is not the big burden bearer that the Pharisees are. He has come to give mercy. Will you come? And, and it's not, you know, part of legalism is adding works to what Jesus did. Trust only in what Jesus did, where he died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and he rose again on the third day. Trust in Jesus alone, because he's the God of mercy. 
Secondly, you don't have to prove who you are at church. This is not a proving place. This is a place where we come to receive mercy and to dispense mercy. We don't need Pharisees here. We don't need Pharisees who are going to be better than others and look down at people who do. We need to come to church saying, I'm in need of forgiveness and I'm in need of forgiving others. And I'm, 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 I'm here to help people find their forgiveness in Christ. And then number three, if we really know Jesus as our savior, we would emulate him, not try to outdo him or exceed him. Legalism exceeds Christ's and the Bible's authority. Christ is enough. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for Christ showing us in a culture of cultural fundamentalism, conservatism, uh, rules, tradition. Oh, Father, help us to distinguish what are no longer necessary guide rails. And really realize what the scriptures say. And to be able to live in freedom and grace. Because Jesus paid it all. And so now in Christ, we are free to do what is right. But righteousness is not determined by an extra set of man-made rules. It's just being like our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, free us in that. Save us from that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, church family. I have the uh, wonderful privilege of leading us all in communion this morning. Oh, sorry. Um, we're in Luke right now, and uh, I thought it'd be a great place to look at um, how the Lord instituted uh, his table. In uh, Luke chapter 22, and when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Our Lord instituted communion on the night before he was betrayed at Passover. The Lord's table is a time of remembrance. It's a symbol of his promise. A new covenant, he says. A covenant is a contract, an agreement. It's the basis of a relationship, details out conditions and outcomes. All of us have a lot of covenants in our lives. AT&T, Disney+, Plus, things we've signed that we don't even remember, right? But the covenants with God are very different. God does most of the work in his covenants. In fact, the Bible is filled with covenants that God had done towards us. Creation, the covenant with Noah, Abraham. And when we look at Passover, it's the culmination of his covenant to the nation of Israel. This new covenant is different. It's a personal covenant to each one of us. This morning, if you've placed your faith, your trust, your whole life in Jesus Christ, this is a time of remembering of this covenant, your personal faith in what the Lord has done. And this is a time for you, not for the people around you, but for you personally. If you don't know Jesus and you don't have a relationship with him, we here, the leaders of this church, would, would be honored to share Jesus Christ with you. But we ask that for communion, you refrain because it has no meaning for you. It was no mistake that Jesus instituted this ritual of the cup and the bread on Passover. Passover is an annual tradition. Next month, April 5th to the 13th, is going to be the traditional Passover season. Jesus transformed Passover into the table that we celebrate monthly and regularly. There's three aspects of communion, a time of remembrance, 
a time to take personal inventory, and a time to look ahead. Oh, there we go. In uh, 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, looking back now, looking back at what the Lord had already done, right? In Luke, he's looking ahead. The Apostle Paul in, um, in 1 Corinthians is looking back now. And when the hour had come, he reclined. Oh, wrong, wrong verse. Sorry, wrong page. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 to 32. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way as he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And this is why many of you are weak, ill, and some have died. This morning, we're going to take a few minutes to do some self-inventory, uh, to reflect and to remember. This is our personal faith, our individual following of Jesus Christ. And then after that, we will partake of the bread and the cup together. I'm, I'm not much of a rule follower. Uh, my youngest daughter is the physical embodiment of not following rules well, and she constantly reminds me that dad uh, sin comes from the father. So I take full responsibility. Um, but I'm so grateful for the salvation that God gives, the grace that he gives us. In 1 Corinthians, it says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please take the, the bread, the biscuit, and let's uh, partake of this together. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please take the cup with me and drink. The last part of communion is always the looking ahead. Of every covenant, there's a commitment, there's a promise. And in verse 29, it says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Our hope for all of us, ultimately, is to be with our Lord and Savior one day. And that's what we look forward to. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for the grace and mercy that you shed upon us. And Father, that uh, we do not follow impersonal rules, but we follow you, that for the first time in the history of man, we have a personal relationship through our Lord and Savior, that we can know you personally. Father, help us to not give that up, not give up the personal aspect of our relationship with you by uh, resorting to rules. Father, we are so grateful for this constant reminder to assess and uh, be invited to your table to re be reminded of how important it is that we follow, follow you. Thank you for this morning and thank you for your word. Bless us this morning and bless us this week in your son's most precious name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. You're dismissed.